Thanks everybody for coming out. I'm super proud and excited to introduce Maggie Sailing to talk to us about Tam Sam Sam and why it's important. Maggie, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. We did call it a sip and learn, so I hope that each one of you has something to drink, which will make this more enjoyable. Okay, so this is all about your market. It's important information, but what is it? What is TAM, SAM, and SOM? TAM is your total addressable market. And this is all the people in all the world that would buy your product or service. It's the huge upside. SAM is your service available market. This is the subset of your general market that you're going to work on first. So it could be in your city. It could be in your state. It could be in your country. It depends on what your service is. And SOM is the serviceable, obtainable market. This is your roadmap for where you're going first. So this is the portion of the SAM that you can realist realistically obtain within one to three years. And I think it is important to qualify it with time. These are numbers that you should know, not just because an investor might be interested in it, but you should determine what type of business you're going to have by understanding these numbers. So you may have a mom and pop type business, which means, well, maybe over time you would be able to have a second or a third location, but it's not the type of business that is going to employ tons of people, create tons of jobs, and garner the interest of investors. But it, I'm sure it's a business that will sustain you and your family and provide jobs for a certain number of people. That's a perfectly acceptable thing. But this is the reason that you need to learn it, is to determine what type of business you're going to have. And then you have to make the decision whether that's what you want or not. We only have live for a certain period of time. So um, focusing your time and energy in things that are going to get you to where you want to go, it's worthwhile to make that investment in the research. Uh, if you look at the left side, you can see that um, I've depicted these in what is called a stacked Venn diagram. It's the easiest way for investors to understand where you're going and it's easy for you to understand too because these are all subsets of one another. I have uh, pulled this slide from uh, Maurizio Lacava's uh, website and he did a survey of a bunch of different uh, investors uh, to show what slides they like to see in their slide decks. And uh, market arrives near the top after describing the problem and your solution, this is one of the first things that an investor wants to know. And the reason they want to know that is because the TAM shows the potential upside, whereas the SAM will de-risk some of it. So let's look at this slide here. So um, the upside is the total amount that's possible if you were a utility then you would have the TAM would be 100% of what's available. And that's why you're a utility. But those are regional in nature, and they don't really apply to any sort of business that you or I might open. Uh, SAM is the serviceable available market, and that gives more context to what your market is that you're going after first. It de-risks it for the investors because they know that there's still all this other stuff out there that you can go for if you're successful in gaining your percentage of the SAM. SAM is generally one to 10% of the total available market. Now the SOM, this is where we get into what can help you with your roadmap for your business. SOM is the serviceable obtainable market it's a realistic view of what you can do in your first market with the sales channels that you've chosen. It's your sales projection, and it doesn't have anything to do with your competitors. It's what you envision capturing as part of your market. And so how do we get at these numbers? There's a couple different ways to do it, and some are preferred over others. Uh, top down, this is where you 
understand what the TAM is, you went and you did your research. There's free um, information available at the UN, the OECD, these first things that I've listed. Um, they all have free information on general market sectors. But that only gives you TAM. So for Sam, you would still have to do more research to either break it down to the geographic area that you're going to do or the subsector of the market that you're going after. And then what we see a lot of people do is they say, okay, that's Tim, this is Sam, and if I can just get 1% of that marketplace, I'm gonna be a billion dollar company. So pulling out of uh, your ear these types of percentages, 1% or 10%, um, investors don't buy that and neither do I. So when I see that, I understand that the person really hasn't done the research that they need to do. So a bottom-up approach, here you're gonna start with your first market and then you're gonna expand geographically. It requires you to do customer research. So bottom up, let's say that we're going to have a fast food restaurant and uh, we're gonna open in Reno and Las Vegas first. Um, we can pretty easily get the fast food for all of the United States. We can pretty easily get the fast food sales for Reno and Las Vegas, combine them. And then we're actually going to figure out, okay, there's hamburgers, there's chicken, there's fast, casual Mexican food. Okay, we can break it down further, but this is where we're going to actually do our own research. We're gonna figure out which protein we're serving for our um, fast food restaurant. And we're going to do a survey of what currently exists for that. And then we're going to actually go out and talk to customers to find out if they would eat at your restaurant? What would they pay for whatever it is that you're offering? Um, and it's very easy to add leading questions to your customers, your potential customers, but don't do that. Just leave it very open, very open-ended. If I were to make a, a burger and put it on a uh, English muffin, what would you pay for that? If I made it a quarter pound burger, if I made it a third pound burger, if I made it a half pound burger, um, you want to get their feedback because you want to be honest with yourself. So that's how you would do a bottom-up approach. If you figure, okay, I polled 100 people and 30% of them said that they would try my burger, then you can make an estimate on your service obtainable market. Um, it's also easy to kind of underestimate this because you can't talk to every person who's ever going to buy a burger from you, but it's very uh, easy to underestimate what would happen here, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. And then the third way to arrive at these numbers is through external research, and that's not something that I recommend for startups. It's very expensive. Uh, you can see some of the, the people that I named here, Gartner, Forrester, huge, huge companies that charge a ton of money for this type of research. Plus it takes a long time and then it'll get stale after a relatively short period of time. Um, some of the business of apps and App Annie, um, those are online things for online uh, businesses. And so the fees are not as high. They're collecting this data anyway. So you can get that information for a lower expense than um, some of this whole market research that Gartner and Forrester do. Um, large companies will tend to use this sort of external research and they'll do it before they break into new countries or before they bring a new product to market or they enter a new sector for their business. So we don't really wanna get involved with that. Okay, let's, let's see some examples. So here is the Uber example. Um, I have some of the information from their 2007 pitch deck. I was not able to um, actually determine what the transportation business worldwide was uh, back in 2007. Last year it was 5.7 trillion, but that included um, sea, air, uh, 
rail and freight. So that was the entire transportation business worldwide, 5.7 trillion. So back in 2007, they, they looked at whatever it was and reported it. Um, but for their SAM, their addressable market, they were only interested in taxis and limousines. So that figure in 2007 was 4.2 billion for the United States. Um, what they did in their pitch deck, and I actually don't recommend doing this. I, I think you should go with a case that you think is somewhat optimistic and pretty realistic. Um, they gave their best case, a realistic case and a worst case in their um, pitch deck. And so their best case would be $1 billion in yearly revenue in about three years, I think was their target. Oh, five years, sorry. Uh, realistic, they would get 5% of the top five cities in the United States. And their worst case was that they would just remain a 10 car, 100 client service in San Francisco. That's where they started. Well, we all know what happened with Uber. Um, their revenue in 2019 was 14.15 billion. Uh, their current valuation was 72 billion. They went public. Um, but since 2007, and remember that's like 12, 12 years ago, it takes a lot longer to build to a case where you're going to go to an initial public offering. And it took a lot of investment along the way. Uh, but they also, added more services. So they went to Uber Eats and Uber X, Uber Freight and Uber Mobility, which I believe are their um, scooters and things like that. So they really underestimated what they were going to be able to do, but who knew? Okay, Airbnb. Now Airbnb started out as air mattresses in people's homes. So that's why it was called Airbnb. And they didn't really, they were creating this new marketplace. They didn't really know how um, to depict it. So they looked at the, the travel industry and they said, okay, there were 1.9 billion trips booked worldwide. And they figured they were gonna come into kind of a lower end. So they looked at the budget and online trips and there were 532 million of those trips. And they thought that they could realistically garner about 10.6 million for their kind of low end thing. And so they did their research on the amount of trips but they didn't research what those things were worth because it didn't really apply to them. Instead, they knew they were gonna do um, a fee per transaction. And they figured that the average fee for three nights at $70 a night was gonna be $20. So they were able to extrapolate what their SOM was gonna be at 200 million in three years. So they planned for three years out. So Airbnb went public December 10th of last year. Um, they had estimated revenue in 2019 of 4.7 billion. And on their first day, they were up 112% and they now have a market cap of 86.5 billion. Uh, they did suffer a little bit last year with COVID, of course, but they still managed to have some profitable um, quarters. So here is another way to depict a two-sided marketplace. Two-sided marketplace is difficult because you're creating something new and you're bringing different groups together and you wanna be in that middle channel where you're taking a percentage of the transaction that those two are doing. So um, this is from our friends at Boom Startup. They're a um, accelerator out of Utah and for this example, they're doing clothing and they're doing customized clothing on the internet. So they looked at these three different areas of the clothing marketplace. And so if we just look at the Psalms for them, they figured the Psalm for custom clothing out of the global clothing market would be 32 billion. Uh, custom clothing manufacturing in the US was at 27.4 billion. And they figured that to do it 
online, their current e-tailing would arrive at 24 billion in through the e through the internet. Okay, so this this is a good depiction of how they're arriving at what they want to do. So I would actually be interested in knowing, okay, how are you taking a percentage? Are you doing a fee? I, I think there's more information that we actually need on this slide, but at least it's one way to depict a multi-sided marketplace. Okay, here we have another example. This was um, a couple of guys that were starting a business and um, I think they were going through Steve Blank's program. And so they were actually told that they had to go out and do market research. So their premise was, we wanna take sports jerseys with famous players and we want to sell them to a person for the season. So it's just rental. And so they wanted to, you know, give the best players the, um, their jerseys to people who are interested in it. So their total addressable market, how big is the universe? But their universe, they were sticking just to the U.S. because the universe in other sports in the other parts of the world would be even bigger. So they figured that 150 million Americans watch the five major sports in some capacity. They were going to start with New York City. So they went with 11 million New York metro area people watch the five major sports. And for their on the ground boots research, they went to a Yankees game. And they talked to people at the game. They went in with the premise that the people who are most likely to be their customers were going to be season ticket holders, they were going to be men, and they were going to be under 30. They figured that they were the fans that would spend money on this type of uh, a rental. And um, so in doing their customer research, they found that 11.7% of the people at a couple of games um, showed interest in doing a season long rental. What they also found though, was that it wasn't just season ticket holders that were interested in doing this. There were people who didn't have season tickets who would love to wear a jersey of their favorite player to the game when they went. So it'd be a one-time rental. And doing it this way, they also found that women would be interested. So if they were making an event out of going to the Yankees um, Red Sox game, that they would want to wear their team colors and they would both do it. The, the boyfriend and the girlfriend would both wear the shirts. So based on the research that they did, they took 11.7% of the 11 million people and they came up with 1.3 million people. And during their research, they discovered that it was probably half and half. Half would buy a whole season long rental. They made it very enticing for them in that if their player got traded, they could automatically switch out to a new player and they would, um, they would receive back. They had free shipping to get the jersey back and clean it. And then they would send a clean new one out to um, the person who had done the season long rental. This doesn't tell us though how they're gonna make money though. Okay, so here is that last slide and now it's depicted in a Venn diagram or a stacked Venn. So it's easier to understand there's 150 million sports fans in the US, 11 million New York City, 1.3 million is their target market for I think a couple, maybe three years. So it doesn't tell us anything about revenue, but here's what they did. They found that the uh, season long rentals would be about 40% of their customers and 60% would do one time. So the one time fee was higher, um, but the season long fee because it was for so many games was um, less per game, but still a lot more. So they took their customers, broke it down by the percentages, times the fees they had for the various uh, products. And then they came up with $169 million in revenue. So, and that was just in one season. Oh no, I guess that, that was over three years. So that's what they figured they could do. That's not bad for a business, a couple of guys starting it, but at least they knew what their market was going to be. 
Also, now an investor knows, okay, it's $169 million in three years, and that's just in one market. Uh, granted, New York may have the most rabid fans, but we've got some strong fans in Chicago and Baltimore and Los Angeles. Well, they're not strong fans, but at least they're willing to spend money on it. Okay, here's a summary. So TAM is the big picture. SAM is more localized, and it's kind of stuff with, within reach within 10 years. And then your SOM is what you think you can obtain in three to five years. And I would caution you again that when you're doing a market slide, this TAM, SAM, SOM, we want to think in terms of money. We don't want to know about the customers. By now, you should have figured out what your business model is going to be. And it can change. But you should have an idea what you're going to charge for your product or service so that when you start figuring out TAM, SAM, and SOM, it actually relates to money, to revenue. Uh, this can be hard and daunting to figure out, but we do have some resources for you. So at the University of Nevada, uh, Tara Rednecki, she does intellectual property. So if you um, want to see if there's a patent on whatever it is that you're doing, she can help you with that. Uh, Patrick down at UNLV can also help you with that and any other kind of market research that you want to do. Uh, they subscribe to different databases. So if you really want to do, uh, let's say we're going back to our fast food example and you need both um, Las Vegas and Reno numbers, I would contact both of them because they do have access to the different um, databases. They can give you demographic information. So if you have created a customer persona, you like those uh, guys did that were going to the baseball game, they were figuring it was going to be a season ticket holder and a guy under 30. And so that's a very specific person. And these databases can help give you an idea of how many people fit that demographic information that you want. Um, most of the research that they do for you will be free of charge. Um, if you're asking for very specific information like emails, that's the thing that I've run into the most where um, there's going to be a fee associated with that. And if they print things for you, there's usually fees associated with that. But if you're willing to receive the information in the email format, there's usually not a fee for that. Um, so these are your resources and that's all I have for this session and we can take questions.